creeps and freaks out there, it's Mopar Monster here again. Went to Riverside Cemetery this past weekend and we learned a little bit more about the symbols and stories. Check it out. <laughs> yeah. All right. So the very first grave that we have come to is Mr. Blotcher. Um, If you look at it, the first obvious thing that you're going to see is what looks like a spear and a cloth draped over it. If you actually get super close to it, it's an American flag. There's very tiny etched um, stars and stripes to it. You have to get really close to see. Which you're welcome to do, by yes, the way, please. if you want to just be careful of those stones, that's all. The, first, the second thing that you're going to see is the helmet. So this helmet shows a World War I American soldier helmet. Um, helmets were also representative of the Greek heroes and mythology. Which, of course, for a veteran of the time, would have been very apropos. Um, <clears throat> the crossed firearms behind it are a symbol for the infantry, so that meant that he was in the army. Um, but the most interesting part for me is on the helmet there is a poppy. The poppy is the flower for World War I. Um, they are associated with the deep eternal sleep. Um, they were used to remember those which had given their lives in battles uh, because they're flowers which grew on the battlefields in France. <clears throat> so, the one thing that I found to be the most interesting about this particular monument is the size, okay? Now, this, this gentleman who is buried here, his name is Fred, he is the one that gave his life in action and um he was a private in world war one and he was essentially victim to the draft now when the draft started he tried to avoid that by explaining that he had kidney trouble and he he couldn't go to war and they said no i'm sorry but you're that's not a good enough excuse and then he says well i've got an injury to my foot i i cannot go and so to, what happened is his father turns in his draft card and the draft card says kidney trouble, injury to the foot. And then there's a note on the bottom that talks about from the person who's accepting the draft card that says that the person, Fred, was not there and that his father had turned it, turned it in on account of he can't walk. And the government must have said, well... He'll be fine. Just send him anyways. And so they send him off to France. And um, unfortunately, what happens is in October, um, there was the... Uh, have, is anybody familiar with World War I, the Argonne Forest? Okay. What happened is these troops were basically stuck being um, attacked by their own people. And they could not send a messenger out because they were instantly killed by German soldiers. And so they would send messenger after messenger and they never got the, the notice. And finally they started sending off carrier pigeons. And they sent off three, four, five carrier pigeons before finally one makes it with a bullet hole in the wing with the message that says that they are shooting at them and for God's sake, stop. So 554 men in the U.S. 77th Division in the Argonne Forest enter. Only 194 of them were rescued. And unfortunately, Fred was not one of the ones that was rescued alive. More unfortunate than that, he was killed. Of course, we know that a month after the Argonne Forest battle, the war ended. And so he becomes the first Clevelander to, um, to pass in World War I. He's brought back here. Um, and there used to be a post, a VFW post, that was named for him. And that's not there anymore. It's now part of the, um, I don't think I wrote it down. I did it. It's off of Fulton Road. And I want to say it's like the Tinnerman something or another that's right there and now it's a restaurant they've restored it and it's beautiful um but it has a different um it has a different meaning now and so 
I just find that there's so much that happened that his parents and he tried to avoid going to this war. For him to pass only one month before the end of the war was just heartbreaking. All right, so this next one, this little guy here was kind of an interesting find. I was, it was the end of my scouting of the area here and I look over and I'm like, oh, that's weird. I've never seen the little figure here of the child and what I'm assuming is a dog. Um, seeing domestic pets in a cemetery that is not a pet cemetery is kind of weird. Um, you usually don't see that. But with this case, you have a little boy sitting here with his family dog. Dogs on graves um, usually represent things like loyalty and friendship. They're also the watchers um, for the soul. So if you think about like um, in Egyptian mythology, Anubis is a dog and he watches the underworld. He is the god of the underworld. It's very much a similar situation here with this young boy who I'm assuming was Herman mm -hmm. and his family dog. Um, an interesting thing I found out too is that the scrolls, anytime you see a scroll like that, it is supposed to be representative of the Book of Life. Um, it's always supposed to be like that whole, it's unfurling and the name of whoever is on it has gotten into heaven because their name is written on the Book of Life. So we've come up here to this beautiful piece. Um, if you look down at the bottom, it kind of looks like Aladdin's lamp. Um, but it's actually an oil lamp. So oil lamps are a biblical reference. Um, they signify things like wisdom and holiness and faithfulness. Um, it's also kind of a reference to God's love lighting up the darkness. If you think about the oil lamps in Bible stories, like the menorah, um, there's the 12 or 11 wise women and the 12 or 11 uh, unwise women, and the wise women are the ones that keep their oil lamps lit for God. The smoke is either supposed to be the Holy Spirit, um, or it is incense, which of course incense is used in a lot of funerary practices. So that curling smoke up around the palm frond, and palm fronds are victory and faithfulness and love. It's all basically saying that Mr. Thomas here was a very holy person and his resting place very much um, with the lamp, light of God, everything definitely reflected that. Okay, so here um, what we have is Charles Thomas. Um, what we don't have is his wife, and I'll tell you why. So uh, Charles married a woman by the name of Maria Williams, um, and together they just had the one son, Arthur, okay? Um, they, what happened is Arthur, um, he marries Emily, and they have Eleanor. Emily passes away, and, and right away he gets married to Ada, and they don't have any children. And so all we have here are just these five, okay? Now, Tom, um, Charles and his wife, they had a farm in Portage area, and... What happens is they decide that they're not going to get along anymore and they're just going to get a divorce. And divorce in the 1890s was not a thing. Um, about 0.04% of marriages ended in divorce. Typically, they would end with one of the spouses poisoning the other. Um, <laughs> because arsenic was readily available where you'd find your flour and your rice and your tea if you were going to the store that day. So they took the amicable way and just parted ways. Charles then moves in with his son, Arthur. Um, Arthur at the time was working for the railroad. Um, and then Maria, she moves out and goes towards Rocky River and becomes a housekeeper and a nurse. And now, of course, back in that time, you didn't have to get a certification to be a nurse like you do now. Basically, if you knew how to heal the sick um, and you had some sense about you and you could take care of the house, you could be a nurse. Um, and so... What happens with Maria is she eventually goes out and um, starts to work with the Welsh home, which is also in Rocky River. It's still around today. And there's a little bit of a connection between Maria, the Welsh home, and someone else that we're going to see on this tour. So that's why I'm talking about her, even though she's not here. Mr. Edison's tomb here. You have to take a really close look at it. 
but it has um, grapes and vines. So, of course, grapes signify um, communion and the blood of Christ. Um, wine is a very prevalent topic in the Bible and in um, church ritual. There's also um, quite a bit of um, the curling vines. Vines are supposed to symbolize the relationship between man and God. Um, it has to do with the entwining of them together. So anytime you see the vines and the grapes, um, you're going to be basically looking at a reference towards communion. If there is bread um, there, then it's definitely the body and blood of Christ. So, um, I've not seen a lot of grapes. He is probably the only one that I have seen between here and Lakeview Cemetery. Um, there's not a lot of fruit that ends up on uh, tombstones. <laughs> so, if, again, it's you got to kind of get close to it to see it. But on the very top of the memorial for Mr. Wood here, um, there is an anchor. So, anchors, you're going to think, oh, he was a sailor. Absolutely not true. Um, anchors, usually if somebody was in um, the Navy or some kind of sailing profession, um, there would actually be a ship involved, or the anchor would be upside down. The anchor here represents hope. Um, it is one of the most common symbols in Victorian um, morning symbology. So anytime you see an anchor, they are wanting you to say that God is my anchor he is the hope in the storm. The other thing that you'll see on, the, I think it's the left side, there is um, a fleur-de-lis. So fleur-de-lis um, can mean a couple of things. It either means royalty, it means the city of New Orleans, or it can mean the Holy Trinity. Um, I have no idea if Mr. Wood had anything to do with New Orleans. It kind of looks like the New Orleans Saints logo. So sort of like going towards that, like maybe he was a big fan. But um, both of those things are very common. Uh, and then, of course, you have the urn on the top with the draped um, death shroud. Very common for the era. Alrighty. So this was probably my most favorite find that I found when doing my research. Um, I'll tell you in a minute. So <clears throat> the first thing that we're going to see is there, you're going to see this kind of leafy looking filigree a lot of times in cemeteries. I always thought that it was just, um, you know, some flowery zhuzh for all of the uh, tombstones, but it actually has a name. It's a flower or plant called acanthus. Um, it's usually seen adorning the tops of like Corinthian columns. You'll see that, but it was associated first with a um, famed sculptor in Rome. His name was Callimachus. And he saw one day that it was adorning the grave of a beautiful young woman who had passed. And he decided that from then on, he was going to use it in his architecture. Um, it's a very thorny, kind of uh, inhospitable plant. But um, it's supposed to represent the hard <laughs> journey from life to death, culminating in the triumph of eternal life. Um, the saying goes that anyone who has these on their tomb has defeated the curse of death um, that was bestowed upon man in the Bible. But my favorite thing about these is um, Mr. Benz's family. So at first glance, you're going to look at the tops of these tombs and think, oh, it's all the same flowers. Each flower is different. So in Victorian culture, the flower language was, it was absolutely just as important, if not more, than the symbols for tombstones. Each of the flowers on these tombs means something different. So if you see daisies, they are the symbol of innocence. Roses are beauty and purity and can also mean martyrdom. Bell flowers, which are kind of like the cute little, like, they look like bells, um, those mean gratitude. Lilacs are a symbol of enduring love. And I've got one more here. Lilies are strongly associated with the Virgin Mary and the Angel Gabriel. Um, if you ever see um, Annunciation paintings, there's always Gabriel, Mary, lilies. It's like the trifecta. Um, 
but it was also picked because it was one of the strongest smelling flowers. And of course, what do you need during a Victorian funeral to mask the stench of a body? Was flowers. So lilies had a very strong, potent smell, and they would mask the smell of decay. Um, hydrangeas, you'll also find on here, they are actually for apology, regret, and forgiveness. Um, there's chrysanthemums also. They are longevity, immortality, the fullness, and completeness. But it can also mean lifelong friendship. I think that might be... Yep, that's all of them. So, as you look at all of these, it kind of puts together a picture of the person and what they were trying to say in the afterlife. Somebody who knows this much about uh, monument language would have to be a creator of monuments. Um, and Philip Binns was. He actually um, had, yes, the Philip Binns right here with a date of passing of 1906. He was the owner of uh, Binns Monumental Works. Um, he was, uh, he did this for 35 years. His building um, was the largest of its kind um, in the country at this time. The building is actually right across the street. Right there, that Kotucky building was the home of Philip Ben's Monumental Works before it became Kotucky. Um, I actually found that piece of information out before I did my research because um, Eddie Kotucky, who comes over here and does all kinds of work in the cemetery, he came over, he found out I was doing some research, and he goes, hey, did you know about our building? I said, what about your building? And then he tells me about this, and, you know, of course, you come over here and you see all of the intricate details of each of these, these stones. It makes sense, then, that this was designed by someone who did this for a living. Now, most of these were done prior to Philip's passing. And so it is possible that maybe um, Fred Benz over here just did not have one designed, or if he was anything like any other, you know, sibling or, or child where you've got that one kid that's just like, I don't want it. I don't want to do it. It could have been something as simple as that, too. There's not anything that necessarily says that Philip did not like that child of his or something like that. Nothing, nothing to that effect. But what I do know is that Andrew is the only one that continued on to his business for um, about 10, 12 years before finally handing the, um, the building then over to Kentucky. This particular monument is very special to me because this was the monument that um, during the very first tour with Jamie, um, somebody had asked what the two symbols here were and I raised my hand and asked and then that kind of was what started it all. So um, it's very near and dear to my heart. So this one, um, obviously this is done in the Gothic style of mausoleums. Um, you can tell it's the Gothic style because it looks like Quasimodo will be swinging down at any moment. Um, the, obviously the first two things that you're gonna see is the two um, circled figures there. So the one on the left, um, torches were, were um, symbolic of the life of the person. The fact that the woman in the circle is extinguishing the torch shows that the life has come to an end, um, that life is no more. Anytime you see an inverted torch, then that is what that means, that this person is no longer. The one on the right there is holding a cornucopia. That is showing that this family was very prosperous in life, that there was much there to give. Um, they were able to live very comfortable, happy lives. <laughs> the angel is also holding their fingers aloft in the blessing symbol with the two fingers. You usually see that in a lot of religious iconography. Um, the other big things that you'll notice are the grotesques on the sides of the building. So, they are not gargoyles. Gargoyles have to have some kind of water coming out of their mouths, hence the gargle of a gargoyle. Um, these are called grotesques. I cannot find for the life of me what those um, creatures are. I believe that they are pigs, but I don't know. Um, that is still something I'm researching there. Um, the flora, if you look, there's a lot of flora in here, a lot of leaves, a lot of flowers. Um, it is a mix of oak leaves, 
which are considered, they're kind of like the king of the trees. Um, oak leaves are strong, they have endurance, um, and there's also acorns in here as well too. And those are symbolic of prosperity and fruitfulness. Um, all of this on here, like if you were a Victorian coming to this funeral, you would be able to pick out and read every little piece of this symbolism. Um, it was, his is probably one of the best examples of Victorian symbolism in this cemetery. So it's one of my favorite monuments. I absolutely love it. It's beautifully maintained and it's a pretty cool, uh, pretty cool piece. So as she mentioned, this was featured on our uh, first tour that we did uh, post COVID, which was the fun facts tour. Um, so if you were on that tour, then you would have already heard my speech about Leonard Schlather. He was a brewer. Um, so today we're going to talk about his second wife, Sophie. Um, she supposedly still wanders the cemetery. And I only know that because there was a little girl who was playing around this area when mom was visiting someone else. And the mom says, come on, let's go. And she says, no, I'm playing with Sophie. And she goes, who's Sophie? And, and she says, I'm playing with Sophie. She's right here. She, the mom freaks out, comes into the office and says, is there a Sophie that's buried over there? And, and we said, well, there's Sophia Schlager, sure. And there's no way that little girl would have known that. And so she was able to describe what Sophie looked like and said Sophie was here playing with her. And um, so that's Sophie's after. We had planned to sit on this, but like obviously not. <laughs> not <yet. laughs> so um, this was my favorite discovery this time around doing um, <laughs> research. So it's obviously a very uniquely shaped monument. Um, it looks like a piece of furniture and that's exactly what it was. So this style of tomb is called an etc. Um, it is a bench tomb that was taken from ancient Greek memorials. So in ancient times, like when the Greeks and Romans would bury their dead, um, it wasn't just a one and done thing. You usually were there for like a couple of weeks and you'd have food and drink and there would be singing and parties and they needed a place to sit. <laughs> so a lot of the tombs in ancient Greece incorporated a bench-like structure. They were called excedras. Um, basically, it was like having a party and they wanted everybody to be comfortable and enjoy themselves. Um, this design here is actually a typically, um, it's a uniquely American design. If you go um, into Europe, you're usually just going to see the just one long looking couch. In the American design, you have the obelisk in the middle with the name on either end. Um, in the Victorian times, it was not unusual to see families um, picnicking on the graves of their loved ones. So Mr. Junge's tomb over here would have been a great place to have a picnic, a little wine, a little cheese, you know, have your place to sit. Okay, so Herman Junge, he came to America in 1865 from Germany. Um, he settled in Chicago temporarily before finally settling here in Cleveland. He was a founder and a partner in a furniture manufacturing company called Rogers, Billings, and Junge. Unfortunately, in 1881, the company um, had a devastating fire. It took out about $80,000 worth of property um, and uh, furniture as well. And so at that time, um, they kind of made their separate ways. And um, Junge, however, continued within the business, specializing in upholstered pieces, so couches. Um, he was also a stockholder in the United Banking Company, West Cleveland Banking, Forest Cities Banking, and the Euclid Avenue National Bank. He was described as a man of gentle nature, kind and caring of anyone he knew, considerate of those around him, and very generous. He was a very well-known and respected man within the German citizens and in a lot of the German clubs, which of course in this time, almost everybody that I talk about um, within our tours is almost always of some sort of German descent, um, and this is no exception. So. Um, everybody's familiar with the name Hans Tiedemann, right? Tiedemann Castle, okay. So he was actually good friends with, with Hans Tiedemann. Um, he actually, uh, Tiedemann actually spoke at his funeral, noting that Herman was a devoted family man, quietly giving away his fortune to his unusually large circle of friends. 
Upon his decision to retire, this is the sad part. He says, I have more than enough to live with and provide for my family. I will spend my days enjoying their company. Unfortunately, he passed less than a year later after his retirement. Um, and he did, uh, in fact, donate the entirety of his, um, of his estate was donated out to different German organizations and things like that. There was probably a list of like 17 different ones. So um, Mr. Stir over here has, I've never seen fish on a monument um, up here in Ohio. But Mr. Stir has, if you look very closely, three fish. And then at the very top, and Jamie was actually the one who discovered this, there's this bread basket. So we all know the tale of the loaves and fishes from the Bible. Um, that is what that is signifying. It also can mean um, fishers of men. It's a reference to when um, Jesus is uh, gathering his disciples and he asks them if he wants to be fishers of men. Um, it was also an underground symbol for Christianity for many, many centuries. Um, let me see if there's anything else. It's, fishes also can be associated with missionary work. Um, and of course, the Victorian times was the heyday of some some successful missionary work and some not successful missionary work. So it's a really unique find on this. And you can, if you get close, you can just see the little tiny loaves of bread in the little basket there. This book in particular, so anytime you see a book that is flopped open like this, with the names of the deceased on it, um, it's referencing, kind of like with the scroll that we talked about on the other side, the Book of Life. Um, it's saying that, you know, again, everybody in here that is buried here made it into the Book of Life. And what's unique about the monument is that you can kind of see, um, depending on the color of the eye, uh, uh, each section by description by the names, each color is a little bit different because it was added at a different time. Um, unfortunately, this monument has had quite a bit of damage over the years. Um, marble like this, um, unfortunately, does not do very well in rain, and it kind of literally melts at some point. Um, but what I wanted to show everybody here is the shells. Um, yeah, one of us. So shells, you'll see them in two places. One on here, usually in this context, signifying um, shells were used to <laughs> baptize people back in biblical times. So, of course, baptism is, is renewal, new life, um, starting over. They also can reference John the Baptist um, because that is what he used to throw the baptism water on people. Um, shells also, in that vein, when I said new life, um, you think of the Venus de Milo and her being born out of the shell, that also plays into this. Shells also will show up in um, children's graves. It's not as common as the little lambs that you see as the doves, um, but the shell, you'll often see sometimes a little lamb or a dove nestled inside of the shell. The shell is over here somewhere, isn't it? The shell is kind of over that way. Yeah, there is a, there, we do have a child's grave that has a shell. Um, as it's just a small monument about that big. Um, but over in that direction, I'd have to I'd have to look it up to see where exactly it's at. Um, but what we've got here is uh, Christian Priestmeyer. He um, he was a Cleveland grocer. He worked for the Weidman Company for some time uh, before kind of going off onto his own deal. He was a member of the Cleveland Retail Grocers Association, um, eventually becoming the president of that association. And uh, prior to becoming the president, what, see, what they would do every year is they'd have a gala of all of the retail grocers in the area. They'd get together and they'd have a gala. It'd be a charity gala. They'd have um, food and dancing and entertainment. They would hang out at Luna Park. And um, there was usually one big uh, event that everyone would look forward to. And one of those years uh, featured Christian Priestmeyer. Um, and, and he was not the president yet at the time, but what he was, was a wrestling partner with the president of uh, the, the Cleveland Retail uh, Grocers Association. And so the big event, and it's a big newspaper headline of the two of them wrestling each other in a wrestling match at this gala event. So come one, come all, see us wrestle. 
<laughs> of a lady. He would often take her on a date to the cemetery and say, hey, if you get married, this is where we're going to end up. Look at, you know, this nice spot that I have for us. And it was considered like, you know, as if he had a nice car or a good job. He had a really nice tomb and a really nice section of the cemetery. What a catch. Um, <laughs> so um, this particular piece, so rocks are like super common. I actually found out that um, a lot of times when you see the boulder tombs, like you've seen those big like rocks, um, those rocks actually were from the land of the person who passed. So they would transport them to the cemetery and use them as kind of like a marker for who they were as people. Um, this particular one, so you notice it's kind of half formed. It's supposed to be the transition between life and death. Um, if you notice that the rock kind of fades into a very nice looking column there. Now, I cannot find whether or not the life is supposed to be the formed column and death is supposed to be the rock or vice versa. Um, but you will see a ton of these, especially in the cemetery. It's a very um, common theme. The ivy that's wrapped around it is um, significant of clinging to God. Um, ivy clings to things and it grows continuously, just like, you know, your eternal life, God's love. Um, so there's a lot of good stuff on here, but anytime you see this, it's basically a transition statement. So our very last one here is the Wieland um, Monument. So you'll see a few of these around here and everyone's like, oh, they're planters, they're for flower pots. They're absolutely not. They are supposed to be like baptismal fonts. Um, so if you've seen those in Catholic churches, you know, they dip the baby in. Um, it's supposed to be a reminder again um, of the spiritual journey. You know, the first two sacrament that you have is baptism. And then the very last one here, the priest anoints you right before you pass. Um, it's supposed to be a reminder of the everlasting life. And the tomb shape, I think, is very fitting for that. So you probably could plant flowers in it. It's pretty hollow, but it probably wouldn't... Uh, it doesn't have the same significance. And there's no drainage for it, so the floors would be waterlogged. Well, that was interesting, wasn't it? I especially like the parts about all the different flowers and every meanings of them. Just, it, it's just interesting. Uh, every individual flower means something. And also, we had a little ghost story in there. So that was pretty cool. Well, thanks again to Riverside Cemetery for doing this. It was free. Uh, they're talking about doing another one in June. Can't wait to check that one out. They're going to be talking about all the different places on Franklin Avenue and the people that are buried there from Franklin Avenue. And I don't know if you know what that means, but the Franklin Castle is on Franklin Avenue. So I'm sure they're going to have some stuff about Hans Tiedemann and probably some of his neighbors over there. So can't wait for that one. Till next time, stay creepy.